Hello and welcome to another Sunday School Lesson Review broadcast for Sunday, January 16th, 2022. The Lesson Review is taken from John, the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 33, and it's titled, Peace and Trouble. I am your host, Minister William Gadsden. I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that enables us to get the Word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Colleen Quarter of the Texas area. And our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. And if you care to reach us, you can reach us by telephone at area code 254-680-4378. And if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. And you can also communicate with us by email. Our email address is greaterpeacembc at peoplebc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. And again, I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I thank God for you supporting this ministry. Now let us pray before beginning our Sunday School lesson. Lord, we thank you, praise you, and ask that you continue to go with this lesson, this section, this Sunday School lesson session that we have each every week. I thank you for those that are listening. I ask a special blessing upon those that are listening, Lord, and I'd ask a special blessing that, Lord, that you continue to guide us in the way that you have it go. And, and I'd ask each and every one that's listening to invite the Holy Spirit into their heart as you go through this lesson, as I am doing here, that I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to be with me as I go through the lesson. I thank you for the things that you've done for me and those that you're providing those that are here to listen. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name is my prayer. Amen. So, introduction to the lesson Jesus completes his upper room discourse in this chapter, the 16th chapter of John. This lesson for today is part of the upper room discourse, but the lesson does not include, in my opinion, a very important part of the upper room discourse. The lesson does not include verses from John, the 16th chapter, verses 7 through 15. So I would like to uh, address these verses in my introduction. And I have included the NIV version of the scripture because I think it provides a clearer picture of what Jesus is saying about the Holy Spirit. But please read the King James Version also for comparison, as I did when I was preparing for this lesson. And then John, the, the 16th chapter, verses 7 through 5, 15, that is, reads. And I'll read the first uh, 11 verses and then we'll dis I'll discuss those. And then I'll go from there on to the remainder. Starting at verse 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for you, for your good, that I, I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now Jesus in these verses is going, telling them that he's going away and he wants to provide comfort for his disciples because of their sadness and that he is going away. Jesus tells them that it is necessary for him to leave them because if he does not leave them, the Holy Spirit will not come to them because he will send the Holy Spirit when he goes back to heaven. Now, it was necessary for Jesus to go back to heaven because of the following. Jesus had completed his purpose for coming to earth to die on the cross to save mankind. Secondly, when he came to earth, Jesus willingly gave in, came in human form and as such, he had to give up his godly quality of being everywhere at the same time or omnipresence. He was not able to be with Mary and Martha when Lazarus died because he was physically in another city, another place. 
But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will have the ability to of, of omnipresence. He will be able to be everywhere at any time. He can be in my, in my heart. He can be in your heart. He can be in every heart, so everybody's heart at the same time. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit to us. Now, the Holy Spirit will show people of this world that Jesus came to show everyone the consequences of sin, that sin, that their righteousness can only be acquired through him, and that judgment, that is through Jesus, that is, and judgment will be dealt to all according to their acceptance of Jesus, the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit wants to bring all to a conviction that compels all to make a decision about Jesus. And if the wrong decision is made about him, an eternity of punishment awaits all that do not accept him. Now, the Holy Spirit desires to show everyone that Satan has been tried in the balances of justice, justice, that is, in the book of Genesis, and has been found guilty, and he will suffer the same fate as those that deny Jesus Christ. He will end up in a lake of fire. Now, the last verses of that, verses 12 through 15, starts off with verse 12. It says, I have more to say to you, more than you can bear now. You can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And that is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now, Jesus tells his, the, the disciples that the Holy Spirit will come to them after he departs, and the Holy Spirit will guide them to know all truth. The Holy Spirit will not come to teach a doctrine of its own, that is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He will only speak what he hears from Jesus, and the Spirit of truth will provide them with knowledge about the future of all mankind. And we can read that. We know in the, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that they needed, need not worry about the destination of their loved ones who accepted Jesus and were not dead. And we're now dead, that is, because their souls are present with the Lord until Jesus returns to gather the church. And then their body in the grave will be resurrected and joined to their soul. And the meaning and the meaning of that souls and the body will be will cre be created as a new creation. And so you see, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus by telling us of the instructions about Jesus. Now he's telling us also about the future because he's telling we can read the book of revelations and get the, the, the entire future what's going to happen here on earth now if one envisions a relationship between the father the son and the holy spirit one realizes that the three are different in their ministries and they do not encroach upon each other's ministry the father sent jesus to earth to be a savior for mankind and jesus willingly went to earth to do the father's will and while he was here, he was constantly saying in the book of John, I must be about my Father's will. Now that Jesus is back in heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit to control the events of this world and to teach the world about what he, what he has said and what he is saying to the world today. Furthermore, the Son does not object to doing the will of the Father, and the Holy Spirit does not object to following the will of the Son. You see, there is a perfect harmony between the three and they do not do things that are in opposition to their nature. Strip, scripture, that is, guided the apostles just as Jesus said he would, the Holy Spirit would do. And he guides us today through uh, the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to complete the teachings of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will guide you to understand the scriptures as you read them. So one must ask the guidance of the Holy Spirit as they read scripture because he will guide you to understanding the scriptures. And that is my short introduction today. This is the end of my introduction. So now let us get into our Sunday school lesson. The Sunday school lesson is titled Peace and Trouble. The lesson text is taken from John, the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 33, our golden text is taken from John the 16th chapter, verse 33, and it reads, 
These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. My lesson has three uh, outlines, sorrow and joy from John the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 22. Prayer in Jesus' name, John the 16th chapter, verses 23 through 28. And comfort in tribulation, John the 16th chapter, verses 29 through 33. So with, for, without further ado, let's get started with sorrow and joy. That's John the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 22. Now, before going into the lesson, I would like to start this lesson section by reading verses 16 through 18 to properly introduce this lesson, 16 and 18 of this 15th, 16th chapter, that is, because that, this is prior to the verses prior to the lesson, and I just these have an important impact on this particular section. So I wanted to read that, the verses 16 through 18. Starting with verse 16, it reads, Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. And because I'm going to the father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. So those are the verses, this is where the, the, the 18th verse comes into this 19th verse. And that said, they said, they kept saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. So now in verse 19, Jesus says, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto him, do ye inquire among yourselves of what I said? A little while and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while and ye shall see me. Verse 19 refers to verses 16 through 18 of the 16th chapter of John. Jesus just told the disciples a story that they did not understand. They were discussing among themselves. And what in the world does he mean? Jesus said, the meaning of in a little while, you will see me no more. And then he said, after a little while, you will see me because I am going to the Father. The disciples were discussing what Jesus meant by these words. As it turns out, Jesus was telling them that he would die on the cross and be buried and they would not see him for a short while. But after God raised him from the dead, they would see him again. Now, Jesus is referring to his death, which was only hours away and resurrection on the third day, which was only days away. He is not speaking of his death and ascension to heaven. He is only telling them that in a little while he will die, in a little while they'll see him again. But he's talking about basically his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day. Jesus knew that they did not understand what he was telling them, and he continues to tell them more about uh, what will happen to them when he leaves them through death. Now, verse 20 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. But the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. The world is going to be rejoiced. Jesus tells them that they will weep and be sorrowful when this occurs, that is, when he dies on the cross. But the world will rejoice. Jesus knew that they would experience sorrow just like we do when a very dear loved one passes away. Then Jesus informs them that their sorrow will only be short-lived because their sorrow will turn into joy when they see him as a resurrected Christ. The following verses explain the joy of the world when Jesus was on the cross, excuse me, on the cross. And you can find that in Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 39 through 43. Starting at verse 39, it says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. They said he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross 
and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. You see, they were happy and they were mocking Jesus. And then to a certain extent, they were mocking God also. So sadly, this is the attitude of the world towards Jesus today. Israel still does not honor him as the son of God. And neither does the majority of the world. A woman, in verse 21, a woman when she is in travail hath sorrows because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now, Jesus further simplifies his story by comparing their predicament, predicament to a woman in labor, awaiting and going through the pains of birth. When the woman sees her child, she forgets all the pain she experienced in giving the child birth. Jesus is comparing the pain they will suffer when he dies to uh, that of the woman's joy in giving birth. When he tells them that when he sees them again, he tells them their sorrow will turn to joy when they see him alive a few days after his death. Now, verse 22 reads, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and your joy no more, no man taketh from you. Now to further comfort the disciples, Jesus tells them that he knows they are disheartened, disheartened because of what he told them, but he informs them that they will see him again, and their hearts will rejoice at his sight. And no one will be able to take that joy away from them. And they were joyful when they found that Jesus was alive and when he visited them. Now, that brings us to uh, the second section of our lesson, and that is verses 23 through 28. And that is entitled, Prayer in Jesus' Name. And in verse uh, 22, 20, 23, and 24, I'll read those together. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The disciples did not pray in Jesus' name to the Father while Jesus was on earth. They didn't say, Father, pray to God for the asking for this and then say in Jesus' name because he didn't do it. But Jesus now tells them that they can ask what they want from the Father from now on in his name. They basically have to speak to the Father, say, I want this, I want that. Uh, please do this, please do that. But it has to be in Jesus' name. The disciples did not, did not ask for vain things of Jesus when he, was, when he had ascended to heaven. Every prayer they prayed about the ascension of Jesus always ended with the words, name, name, the name of Jesus. When they did miracles, they said, in the name of Jesus. For example, when Peter and John witnessed the lame man in the temple, he's at the temple entrance expecting money uh, from them, they told the man that they did not have silver or gold to give them, but they, in a sense, Pray to God the Father and ask him in the name of Jesus to allow the man to walk. And God granted their wish and the man's legs gained strength and he was able to walk for the first time. And he was leaping up and down, following them around. And I'm sure that there was joy in his mind because he, he, was, he had been lame since his birth. He had never been able to walk. And now he's able to walk. So Peter and John were doing what Jesus had told them to do. Ask the Father in my name, and he will give you what you want. Now, again, the disciples never asked, according to that Santa Claus uh, situation, where you want, ask everything you want and, and things you don't really, really need, you ask them. They were doing these things sincerely in the name of Jesus, just like we should do today. Peter and John are now aware that they can ask for things in Jesus' name, and he will give it them. Now, verse 25 reads, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Jesus had been speaking in Proverbs when he told them about the woman in travail and about they would see him in a little while they'd see him and in a little while they, would be, they wouldn't see him. They wouldn't see him and in a little while they would see him. 
Jesus explains why he spoke to them in figurative language of that nature to, or Proverbs earlier. That is the wise and the instructive sayings of what Proverbs are. Jesus had earlier stated that he spoke to them in parables because they had been given the knowledge of mystery of the mysteries of the kingdom, but others were not given that knowledge. And then you can find that in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 10 through 11. Matthew 13, verses 10 through 11. He tells them that the time is coming when he will no longer speak to them in figurative language, because when he leaves them, the Holy Spirit will inform them of the will of the Son, of the, of the Son to them or for them. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will give them knowledge of heavenly things plainly in order for them to understand all concepts about the Father and heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, I spoke to you in parables and in, in, in Proverbs, but the Holy Spirit will speak plainly to you. And for example, when Jesus spoke to them in figurative language describing a woman in labor and the vine and the branches of the previous lessons, they did not immediately understand what he was saying. The Holy Spirit will speak plainly to them when he comes, as he did with Peter when he refused to eat unclean things when he was just before he was going to Cornelius' house, a, a, a Gentile. The Holy Spirit plainly said to him, do not call anything that God has made plain, unclean or plain. So this was just a, a plain language. Peter understood exactly what he was saying. He didn't have to guess. Now verses 26 to 27 read, At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. Let me read 26 again. I think I didn't, I left out a word. 26 says, And that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Jesus tells the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes to them, they can ask for things of the Father. But Jesus says that he will not pray to the Father for them because the Father loves them because they love him and have believed that he is God and he came from God. So God will give them what they ask for. In other words, they can go to Jesus. You and I go to Jesus and, 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 and he is our advocate. But he is saying here because you, you have a special case. You have basically, he says, the Father's, when Jesus told him, he says, and I say unto you, not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. He's saying, you can pray to the Father yourself. And then we go to verse 28 and it reads, I came forth from the Father and am come unto the world again. I leave the world and go to, to the Father. Jesus again tells him that he came into the world to be a sacrifice for mankind but now he will leave, soon leave the world and go to be with the Father again. And that concludes section two, or outline, that is. So now we get to the final one, comfort in tribulation, verses 29 through 33. I'm going to read verses 29 through 31, and then we'll discuss them. Starting at verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speaketh thou plainly, and speaketh no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knoweth all things, and needeth not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest from God. Jesus asked, answered them, Do you now believe? When Jesus finished speaking, the disciples told him, he told them that when he speak, when he spoke those words to them, they did not understand what he said. But now they say they understand what he was saying because Jesus has made it plain to them. Jesus has told them about what would happen to them in the coming hours and days. Jesus has also told them that the Father loved them because they loved him. Then he informs them that he would return to the Father, but he would not leave them without a way to be with him, to communicate with him, that is, because he will send the Holy Spirit to teach them all things they need to further the kingdom of because the Holy Spirit will tell them 
what he hears from Jesus, and he will then tell the disciples, and as he does with us today. The disciples tell Jesus that they understand what he said now because he has spoken plainly to them and not in figurative language. The disciples said now they know that he came from God and they express their confident faith in Jesus, Jesus' heavenly origin. They internally express faith that they would follow him always. But Jesus knew that they would be scattered during his trial and he would be left alone without support from them, from human support, that is. After their confession, Jesus asked them if they believed because he knew that they would be scattered during the trial and conviction because even though they understood what Jesus had said to them, they lacked the faith to back up their understanding and conviction. And Jesus asked him, uh, Jesus said, do you now believe? And they said they do. And we do similar things as well. We say we believe in Jesus, but when the rough times come, we kind of back off on that sin. But it, we still believe in Jesus, but we just, our sinful nature says we want to kind of keep things as we want them to be, that is. Now, verse 32 says, behold, the hour cometh. Yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Jesus tells them a simple fact about themselves, that they will each soon leave him, and he will be alone with the Jewish leaders who want to kill him. And Judas basically came and, and gave Jesus a kiss. They capped, they basically, the soldiers basically, or the Roman it was basically probably the palace guard, the temple guards came and took him. And that is when Peter basically took his knife out. Jesus says, even though they will leave him, he will not be alone because the heavenly father will be with him. Now these things, verse 33 reads, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is telling them this so, telling them this so that they might have an understanding of the situation that will exist after he leaves the world. The disciples will experience untold tribulation because of Jesus. But Jesus tells them to be cheerful because he will overcome the hatred of the world and they will suffer many things once he leaves. And all of them, except John, will be killed or martyred because of Jesus. But they all did what Jesus told them to do after he ascended to heaven. And even though they were killed because of this, their souls went to be with the Lord and are today awaiting the time when their bodies will be reunited with their souls. And they will then become a resurrected body that suffers no pain and they will be fully with Jesus as a, as the glorified human being, being with Christ. And that, my Christian friends, is the is essence of this Sunday school lesson, in my opinion, for this week. Now let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I thank you. I praise you because you are worthy of the praise that I can give you and all of those that are listening can give you. And we thank you, Lord, for being the God that you are, merciful God. Lord, we thank you for all the things that you've done for us. We, you've done so much for us that we couldn't, if we had a thousand tongues, we couldn't basically tell all of the things that you've done for us. I thank you and I praise you for those that are listening. And again, as I always say, if it be thy will, I'd ask a special blessing be bestowed upon them. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, I ask all these things. Amen.